Jennifer, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another weekly reading vlog. I thought that I might do some vlogging this holiday season uh, because I very rarely get to post a December wrap up, so I thought it might be a little bit fun uh, to do some fun and festive things each week in the lead up to Christmas and just share my reading with you guys. Today it is Saturday, it's Saturday after Thanksgiving, and so as you can imagine, not much reading has gotten done between now and Thursday. So I am still in the middle of these Violent Delights. I am hopefully going to finish that today. Um, and then I would like to move on maybe to a classic. I'm just not sure which one. But I am having my monthly meeting on Monday with uh, my friend and co-worker who I'm reading Bleak House with. Uh, so I did read part two of Bleak House this morning uh, in preparation for that. And I have to say, I definitely did not remember anything about part one. When it started in on part two, I got the audiobook to kind of help me along because I thought with the audiobook it would be easy to kind of go back a chapter and refresh myself every time we have to do a new part each month. And definitely, I am definitely going to need to do that because when it started out, I was in part two, so I was in um, a girl called Esther's Perspective. If you don't know anything about Bleak House, it does something interesting in that it has both a third person perspective that's very, you know, general looking in on several different characters. And then it has a first person's perspective that is from a girl called Esther's point of view. And so I think it's a really interesting thing in terms of Victorian literature. And I don't know that I like her perspective as much as the third person perspective. I think the third person perspective is where Charles Dickens is definitely showing off. It's where he's doing all of his really beautiful language. So this started out in her perspective with a bunch of different characters and I was thinking, now who is this? I couldn't figure out who a couple of the characters were. It's been so long. Uh, so I think this has proved to me and I can't wait to hear his perspective on things that maybe the month to month doesn't help me retain it as much, which was kind of our hypothesis. Our hypothesis was, if we read this across multiple months, would it stick with us longer? Would we feel far more of an attachment to the book? And I think we both kind of thought, well, we'll come to the end of it and feel like, wow, we've spent a really long time with these characters. These characters are our friends. And I think definitely that will probably be the case. But when you read so much in between the parts, I think it's made me forget where I was. Uh, and so there's not really in either one of these first two parts like a cliffhanger or something. Uh, and so I feel like when it ended, it ended in a place that's maybe not all that memorable. Definitely a place where if you're reading the book straight through, you would just continue on reading. So I'm very interested to hear what his perspective on things will be on Monday. Uh, so I think we will have two meetings this month. So we're technically meeting on Monday because it's still November. We put this off uh, because I've been bad and I haven't read my part. So I think we will meet again before Christmas to discuss part three. And I think I will definitely be in a better space to remember part two than I have been with part one. So if we read part three, it will only be within the next couple of weeks. So I think I will definitely remember where I was better than that. So that's all the reading update that I have for you right now. So yesterday the tree did get decorated while we were watching Emma, the new Emma from 2020, which I think is potentially my favorite movie of the year. And I know that's not saying much since no movies have come out this year really, um, but it's just so beautiful. It is so beautifully filmed. The costuming is beautiful. The casting was amazing. Honestly, watching it kind of made me want to reread Emma. And I can't believe I am saying that. I really can't believe I am saying that because I am quite controversially not Jane Austen's biggest fan. And so I can't believe that 
Emma has really connected with me in the way that it has, but I just love, love, love that film. Uh, so the Christmas decorating is now done, I think. So the rest of the Christmas season can be spent relaxing, can be spent baking, can be spent cooking. Uh, so I am really looking forward to it. I'm thinking that I will have a fairly laid back rest of the day. I did just get done filming my November wrap up. Uh, so I did want to film something else, but I don't think that I'm going to. Uh, so that's all for me right now. I will update you again later. So I thought I would show you a couple of my favorite Christmas ornaments. So this is one of my favorites right here. And I got this in Rome last year when I was in Santa Maria in Trastevere, which is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful church. Uh, and so this was hand painted and I got this in the gift shop. Isn't it really beautiful? It is really, really stunning. Right below it is another one of my favorites, the swan. I got this when I went to Prague. I went to Prague when I was studying abroad at Christmas. And that was a really, really wonderful experience. If you ever get to go to Prague, I do encourage you to go at Christmas because it's just absolutely amazing. And swans are really big there. You will see a lot of swans when you are in Prague, not only in terms of decoration, but literally outside. They have lots of swans. It's kind of amazing to me as an American when you go to Europe to see all of these swans. Like England has a lot of swans. Uh, in Prague, there were a lot of swans. In Copenhagen, where I lived, there were definitely swans. And it's just interesting that maybe here in the States, I don't know that I have ever seen one. And overseas, you see them all clustered together. I mean, maybe 20 or 30 of them I saw together in Prague, which was really amazing. <laughs> Here's a new favorite, which I got from the Old North Church. I ordered this online earlier this year uh, when things started getting bad in terms of the pandemic because they definitely needed some help. So they encouraged everybody to order something from their gift shop. So I ordered some shirts and I ordered this lantern. The Old North Church is in Boston. Uh, and so it's a very famous place in terms of colonial and American Revolution history uh, because this is where Paul Revere told them to hang one lantern if the British were coming by land, two if they were coming by sea, and the next day were the battles of Lexington and Concord, which were the opening engagements in the American Revolution. So they are very big on lanterns at the Old North Church. I also have this gold one from the Old North Church when I visited it. So I visited Boston in 2015 and I got this when I got to visit the Old North Church. It's really, really beautiful. That's exactly what it looks like. I also really love this. This is a paper ornament and it was very, very cheap. I don't think it was but maybe two euros. And I got this when I went to Mont Saint-Michel uh, in France. And so the Mont Saint-Michel is towards the top of France. It's really between Brittany and Normandy. Over the years, it has both been a part of Brittany and a part of Normandy. Uh, and so this is a really fascinating monastery on a hill that floods every day. So it's out kind of in the bay and every day it floods and it becomes an island. And so you can only reach it when the, when the tide is out. They now have a road that you can get to it at any time, but kind of the mystique of it is that you could stay out there overnight and be on an island. It's a really beautiful place. It's probably one of my favorite places I've ever been. It is stunning. And to be a little paper ornament, just to be a little paper cut, I just think it's really beautiful. I also have lots of little birds and I love these little birds. They fill up nice holes on the Christmas tree. And so they are really cute. These are some of my favorites. And then I have this that I got at Winchester Cathedral. This is of Winchester Cathedral. And so I kind of collect Christmas ornaments when I travel. And unfortunately, I don't have all that many. I don't have a Christmas ornament from every place I've been to, which is truly the ultimate goal. But this is definitely the first one I bought. So this is the first in my collection of ornaments I bought when I traveled. We also have these, and these were in a set that we got one year when we went to Topsail Island, which is a really big beach here in North Carolina. And they used to have a Christmas shop that unfortunately I don't think is there anymore. And so we got a set of these and I love these. I don't know why, because typically I don't like colors that are not Christmas colors, so the blue on it would really typically bother me, but I just am obsessed with these. Unfortunately, one year our Christmas tree fell down, uh, and so I think a couple of these broke and a couple of others of our favorites broke years ago when we had a real tree, it fell down, and we had to tie the tree to the wall. Uh, so that's one of our Christmas horror stories in terms of ornaments, but I love these as well.
Well, it is Sunday afternoon and I do have some reading updates. I finished these Violent Delights yesterday and I mean, I'm pleased with where it went. I kind of saw where it was going and I kind of saw some of the big reveals coming, which is fine, but I don't know. I'm still torn on whether or not I think it should be a series. I can see why it's going to become one and I definitely see based on where she stopped it that there are a lot of different ways that this could go. I just don't know how I feel at this point about making retellings in particular into series. I, I don't know and I don't know why I feel so weird about that but I'm actually okay with it being a series I think and I will definitely carry on with it. It will just depend on how book two goes. I'm not sure if it's going to be a duology or if it's going to be a trilogy um, and I think a duology would make me very happy. It would make me happier than a trilogy would because that would make a whole lot more sense to me. So I'm a little bit torn on that, but individually, These Violent Delights was just a really wonderful read. I'm excited to see what other people think about it since it's just come out. I'm excited to see if other people feel very fondly for it or if it really got overhyped. I don't think it did. I actually really enjoyed it and I think the hype was entirely justified, but I'll be interested to see if other people feel similarly. But after watching Emma while decorating the tree, I kind of was in the mood for something Jane Austen-like said at the time. And so I picked up Miss Austen by Jill Hornby. And this is a book really basically about Cassandra, who is Jane Austen's sister. And it's delving into the question of why Cassandra burned Jane's letters. This is something that happened historically. Cassandra went back and basically got rid of all of Jane's letters, anything that would have been incriminating or would have caused any drama around the their family. And so this book goes a long way to explain her actions because she's unfortunately been vilified for many, many years because of that. And this book tries to explain kind of the differences in time and how it was very, very important at the time, the reputation of your family and things that we would think you know, are nothing, are not even really juicy details, it could have been very incriminating to them at the time. And so she also explains some things and gives some background to details in Jane and Cassandra's life that might be why Cassandra wanted to get rid of the letters. I really enjoyed this. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to rate it. Um, These Violent Delights was definitely a great four-star read, but I don't know where this is going to settle for me. I enjoyed it, but not a lot happened. Uh, I will say that not a lot was going on. I did really like the exploration of women's roles and particularly women's roles at the time and how hard it would be to be a single woman living in the early to mid 1800s, how difficult the life of a spinster could be, but also how great it could be and the freedom that you had to do whatever you wanted. There were a lot of ups and downs to this that I thought were really thought provoking in terms of historical discussion of the time period and discussion of Jane Austen and Cassandra's life. And I think this book really makes you contemplate Cassandra and understand Cassandra. And so if you're somebody who's always been a little bit skeptical of Cassandra because she got rid of those letters, I think this book makes you feel for her and makes you understand her perspective, whether or not the explanations that Jill Hornby puts on the page happened or not. I think you come to an understanding with Cassandra and you definitely get why she would have wanted to do this, even if you don't necessarily agree with that.
it is a bright and chilly day here. I think the high today is going to be 42 Fahrenheit. It is my kind of weather, finally. I am really, really excited about it. Finally getting to wear a turtleneck outdoors. So, since I finished Miss Austin, I haven't really read much of anything else, but I do think I'm going to start The Monk by Matthew Lewis, which is a gothic classic, and it's supposedly very spooky and very creepy, and it really tainted the author's reputation when he published it, and people knew that he was the one that wrote it. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. I don't know that I'll stick with it. It's okay so far, I'm maybe 40 pages in, but I don't know whether or not it's something I'm actually in the mood for. So I will let you know when I reach around the 100 page mark. That's normally when I call it quits. That's when I decide to DNF or to commit to a book. That's when I post about it on Goodreads. Uh, and I don't really mean DNF. I just mean I'm not in the mood for it. I do technically DNF it, but I always intend to come back to it. So that would definitely be the case here. That is what I decided to pick up. It's a really nice chilly day here on the 1st of December. My birthday is next week and so I am debating getting a cake. I think I probably will get a cake and I will definitely show it to you whenever I get it. But uh, this is my favorite time of year. It honestly is. I think the bridge between autumn and winter is my favorite time of year. So today it is Thursday, so I need to wrap up the weekly reading vlog for this week. And I'm sorry for having such poor reading updates this week as I really have not done a lot of reading. So just a few final updates for you this week. I have tentatively put down The Monk by Matthew Lewis. I got about 40 pages in. I just said I'm not in the mood for 18th century literature. Uh, there are a lot of weird punctuation and capitalization uh, kind of quirks to 18th century literature that we really do not do now. And so it does take a moment to trick your brain into the space where you can understand it. And I really did not want to put that work in this week. I definitely think I will probably like The Monk, but I also think I'm going to likely have problems with it. Uh, so this is one I'm going to put on the back burner. I don't think I'll say I'll finish it before the end of the year uh, because we have less than a month until the end of the year, but I definitely think The Monk will be going on my 2021 TBR. So I did have my Bleak House meeting and we did not have all that much to say about part two of Bleak House, which I feared. I definitely didn't have as much to say as he did. Uh, so I feel terrible. I'm going to look up for some discussion questions this weekend because we have decided to have our part three discussion next week. Uh, so I get to read part three of Bleak House over the next few days. Um, but to give you an update as to where I am with part two, that's right here. Part two ended basically right at 100 pages. So we are already 100 pages into Bleak House in my edition, and I'm really shocked by that. I think that's really making me feel better about the whole process is that you read in very manageable chunks, but you definitely see progress in reading the book. Uh, so when you're reading each individual part, you don't feel as though you read all that many pages, but you definitely read a fairly big percentage of the book, which I think is really helpful in reading a book of this size. And it's also really helpful to have somebody who is holding you accountable. So that's going to be on my agenda for the weekend. So last night on December 2nd, Wednesday, um, Kate Howe and Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space had been running a read-along in Nonfiction November of Romantic Outlaws by Charlotte Gordon, which was my favorite book of the year. And they invited me to come to their Zoom discussion of it, which was very kind. And I tried my hardest not to just be, I love Mary Shelley the whole time. Uh, but it was a really interesting discussion uh, because I think a lot of people had a different opinion to me, and I think a lot of people who read it for their read-along took to Mary Wollstonecraft more than they took to Mary Shelley. And to me, it was like Mary Shelley was like a beacon of light. Like, I felt like I was struck by lightning reading about her, and I don't know if maybe I just identify with her, and so I felt this real genuine connection with Mary Shelley, or if I am just maybe more intrigued by the circle that Mary Shelley ran with, that Mary Shelley 
was not only kind of a genius in and of her own right, but that she was surrounded by other brilliant minds of the age. I don't know, but it was really interesting to hear that uh, Kate asked a question, did you admire one of the women more than the other? And everybody said yes. And I was like, okay, I feel really confident. And I think everyone else said Mary Wollstonecraft. And I think on an objective level, Mary Wollstonecraft had a very difficult life, but I, I, I don't know what it is. Mary Shelley, I came out of that book with such an incredible appreciation and admiration for Mary Shelley as a person. I mean, I, I genuinely, I feel emotional talking about Mary Shelley and thinking about the things that she went through. And so I definitely think I had a different reading experience to everybody else. Anyways, after having that discussion, I felt the need to dive back into Percy Shelley. I realized I had been ignoring Percy for the past few months. Um, and I have mostly been focused on Byron because Byron is now potentially, potentially my favorite poet. I know, uh, not above Dante, but maybe, maybe tied with Dante. Let's, I, I, I do not know, I have truly, been impressed by everything I have read from Byron, but I've had some rough spots with Percy Shelley. Uh, so last night I decided to read some of Percy Shelley's own notes to uh, a couple of his works of poetry. So the main thing I read were his notes to Queen Mab. Uh, and Queen Mab is one of the very first works of Percy Shelley's that I read when I first started getting into the romantics earlier this year after reading uh, Romantic Outlaws. And I just found this really interesting. He has this really long section here, and I think it goes on to the next page, as a matter of fact. But this is kind of a note on a line that says, even love is sold. And it is basically him explaining his perspective on marriage and why we as a society don't need marriage. Marriage is really terrible. Uh, and so I think it explains his perspective on kind of the free love of the romantic era. And it also shows eventually what Mary Shelley and his first wife Harriet had to deal with because he definitely thought being faithful to one woman was ridiculous. Like that's absolutely ridiculous. That's part of why marriage is a scam. But I also really liked that he had something to say about prostitution and how um, he of course believes that it's a result of marriage, that if people were allowed to do what they wanted, there would be no need for this. But he very much took up for women in that profession and, you know, talked about how they are always villainized in society. She lives a life of infamy. The loud and bitter laugh of scorn scares her from all return. She dies of long and lingering disease, yet she is in fault. She is the criminal. She the forward and untamable child. And society, forsooth, the pure and virtuous matron who casts her as an abortion from her undefiled bosom. And so I have to say, I wrote a note and it's kind of like, Percy, were you a feminist? Question mark. I, I actually think he had a lot of good to say. And I think his criticism of marriage is also very understandable from the time period. And I certainly see why women in the romantic movement perceived free love very differently to men. To men, it's like, I don't want to be faithful or I don't want to be tied down. And it's kind of ridiculous to assume you would ever want to be with one person for your entire life. But for women, it's like, I get to choose my partner. Uh, Mary Shelley very much felt like I chose Percy Shelley as my life partner. And she didn't get when he kind of wanted to step out and have affairs with other people. She was upset about it. He didn't understand why that was upsetting to her because he thought, hey, this is the way it is, we're against marriage. But she thought, no, we chose each other as partners. We don't need marriage to legitimize the connection between us. Of course, they eventually did go on to get married. But I found that very interesting to see his perspective on this. And I also found it interesting that in these notes to Queen Mab, uh, Queen Mab is a very, very controversial work because it displays some of Percy Shelley's atheism. But the interesting thing is, I don't necessarily think Percy Shelley was an atheist uh, because he says, there is no God. That's the line he has. But he says, this negation must be understood solely to affect 
a creative deity. The hypothesis of a pervading spirit co-eternal with the universe remains unshaken. So he believes something is out there, but he doesn't believe that it's kind of the line sold by the church. I think maybe agnostic is a better term for him. I think he struggled with organized religion, and I do think he struggled with Christianity, so maybe he is an atheist. He certainly viewed himself as an atheist. But the most interesting thing about this to me is that he thinks belief is not something you choose to do. He thinks belief is something that is proven, that God shows himself to you or speaks directly to you, and that's proof, that's belief. Belief is something that is automatic, and uh, so basically nobody should believe anything because there is no proof. But something that stuck out to me is that faith did not enter his discussion of it at all. And I think for most people who are religious, um, faith is a major aspect of believing. You believe things on faith, you maybe can't see proof or you don't get the answers that you want. You don't get direct contact with a higher power, but you believe and you believe because you have faith that they are there. So I'm going down a philosophical path here with Percy Shelley and I don't like philosophy. I've said it before, I'll say it again, but I can't believe that all of his philosophical notes to Queen Mab, and I would say Queen Mab is a very philosophical poem and it's not gonna work for everybody. And I'm shocked in many ways that I really enjoyed it because I don't typically enjoy philosophy, but I think I find this interesting. I love the discussion of religion in anything, whether or not the person is a believer or not, of the same faith as I am. I just think the discussion of religion is always really interesting. And Queen Mab and Prometheus Unbound, as a matter of fact, also by Percy Shelley, share a lot of similarities with the life of Christ. He puts in a lot of kind of paraphrased Bible verses or makes Prometheus in particular and Prometheus Unbound do things and act a little bit like Jesus. And so I'm constantly wondering, why is he doing this? If he doesn't believe in that, why why is he going there? And I think the thing is, is that he doesn't like how the church or how Christians have moved away from Christ's teachings in his own day. And so he's kind of hearkening back to Jesus as a figure rather than the religion as a whole. A lot of interesting things here. Percy Shelley fascinates me, and I would genuinely love to sit down and have a cup of tea with him and pick his brain. And I'm sure that we would be able to have a discussion without offending each other, which I think is the really interesting thing about Percy Shelley and the mark of a great writer is that I don't feel like he has stepped on my toes as a person of faith. And I don't feel like if I came to him and spoke to him from my perspective that it would offend him. I just think that we could have an interesting intellectual discussion. Uh, but I am looking forward to carrying on with Percy Shelley. I'm still a little bit in love with him. I still really like him and I feel bad that I've kind of cheated on him with Lord Byron. And I am interested to carry on with some romantic poets this weekend as well. I would love to know how your week of reading has gone, uh, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.